And here in uh, Puerto Rico, good evening um, in the parts of Egypt uh, and uh, Asia. My name is Gloria Rodriguez Vega, known as Glory, and uh, I will be moderating this session today. Um, and to begin with our first lecture, Anesthesia and Natural Disasters, I want to introduce Professor John Doyle. He is from the Department of General Anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic and also professor of anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic uh, Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Uh, he received his medical degree in 1982 and his PhD uh, degree in biomedical engineering in 1986 from both uh, the University of Toronto. Um, he's received his Canadian Board of Certification in anesthesia in 1986 and the American certification in 1989. He has a long-standing interest in ENT anesthesia, difficult airway management, as well as interest in the use of technology in medicine. His research has been supported by a number of funding agencies, and he holds positions in a number of editorial boards. Um, Dr. Doyle is also past president of both the Society of Airway Management and the Society for Technology and Anesthesia. He has received clinical teaching awards on four occasions, he has been a speaker uh, both nationally and internationally, and we welcome him today at Mega Learn, Engage, and Connect, um, Dr. Doyle. Thank you, uh, thank you, Glory. I'm going to talk about anesthesia and natural disasters, and the outline here ranges from COVID-19, the disaster that we face on a daily basis around the world, as well as a discussion of disaster management processes, emergency response medical teams, some of the training resources and opportunities that are available, the special role of ketamine and regional anesthesia in some of these natural disasters, how to manage ventilated patients in a natural disaster setting when there's limited resources. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some conclusions and at the end of uh, the slide set are a variety of references that can be useful to you. So let's get started. Here are a list of some of the threats and natural disasters that we have to be concerned with. We have biological threats such as the COVID-19 virus, chemical threats such as bioweapons, droughts, earthquakes, fires, flood, hurricanes, landslides, nuclear uh, radiation disasters, uh, such as happened at Three Mile Island in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanoes, firestorms, and winter storms. Winter storms, something that I'm particularly uh, familiar with living in Cleveland at the moment. Uh, for many of us, the COVID-19 virus is the big disaster around the world, uh, killing millions and continuing to kill millions. We're familiar with many of the basic strategies in dealing with them, avoiding close contact with sick individuals, frequently washing our hands, practicing good respiratory hygiene. This is not new to us, so I won't go on at length, but the uh, uh, Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation has come up with some recommendations for standard practice in the anesthesia work environment that uh, are useful in this context as well as in the context of patients in general. And they uh, make specific recommendations that apply to all patients, not just the patients with uh, COVID-19. They talk about hand hygiene and alcohol-based hand gels should be located near every anesthesia workstation. The use of uh, personal protective equipment uh, is emphasized and they suggest a lower threshold for planning elective or semi-elective intubations in relevant cases. And they talk about the role of N95 masks, which should be used for all known or suspected cases of COVID-19, as well as any asymptomatic open airway cases, such as we find in interventional pulmonology. Um, so I, uh, you are advised to take a look at the Anesthesia Pac Patient Safety Foundation's recommendations that are detailed here, as well as to take a look at their specific recommendations that have been published for uh, patients suspected to be infected with the COVID-19 virus. Uh, they suggest that these patients should not be brought into the holding area and should be managed in a designated OR with appropriate signs, should be recovered in the OR or transferred to the ICU in a negative pressure room, and some planning ahead in terms of the use of personal protective equipment and barrier precautions should be necessary, and consider intubation early to avoid the risk 
um, of a crash intubation when PPE cannot be applied safely. So these are some of the recommendations that I would bring to your attention. Some of the things that they recommend, uh, double gloving, standard ASA monitoring, N95 mask at a minimum. PAPRs can be superior protection when uh, uh, they are available. You want to sign the most experienced anesthesia personnel uh, where possible. Avoid training intubation for sick uh, patients and avoid fiber optic intubation unless it's absolutely necessary. Atomized local anesthesia can aerosolize the virus around the room. To do a rapid sequence induction, you'll do it in the usual way, but they recommend the use of a video laryngoscope. It can be advantageous uh, and you may need to modify it. If you're going to do manual ventilation, apply small tidal volumes. And they recommend that use of a high efficiency hydrophobic filter placed in between the face mask and the breathing circuit. Uh, they recommend resheathing the laryngoscope immediately post intubation using a global, uh, double glove technique. And after removing all the protective equipment, avoid touching your hair or face. And then of course, wash your hands. So um, these are some of the recommendations from the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Not everyone is aware that there are enormous differences between the N95 mask and an ordinary surgical mask. The N95 mask removes 95% of reticulates that are 0.3 microns and larger, and this includes uh, bacteria and viruses. A surgical mask protects the wearer from splashes of blood and bodily fluids and protects others from diseases that the wearer may have, but doesn't protect against bacteria or viruses. So the role of the N95 mask is especially important and should require special fitting when you breathe in the air should be sucked through. when you breathe in the air should be sucked through the mask itself and not come around the sides if the air is coming in from around the sides you're being exposed to whatever you're trying to protect yourself from and special knitting uh, uh, fitting stations are available for n95 masks here from the canadian journal of anesthesia are practical recommendations for critical care and anesthesiology teams caring for the covid19 virus. I recommend that you take a look at this, but you can see the personal protective equipment that is being used, the PAPR in the left uh, panel and the styleted endotracheal tube in the right panel. Here they're showing intubation on a mannequin using an ordinary laryngoscope, but many authorities recommend the use of a video laryngoscope as you can intubate with your head farther away from the uh, a patient's mouth in such a case. So video laryngoscopy can be particularly helpful. Now, in general, there are a number of stages to dealing with natural disasters. First on the left, we have mitigation, uh, pre uh, preventing uh, disasters from happening, then preparedness for disasters, getting the equipment in location, and then responding to these disasters and then recovering afterwards. So there's four stages, mitigation, preparedness, response to the disaster, and recovery afterwards. Disaster mitigation and preparation measures are those that eliminate or reduce the impacts and risks of the hazards uh, taken proactively. And examples include disaster plans for communities, schools, uh, hotels, hospitals, pre-designed shelters, clean uh, water storage uh, and food storage, firefighting equipment, diversion dams, as you can see on the right, and flood mitigation equipment that uh, you can see example on the, on the right. So this is disaster mitigation and preparation. The disaster response involved elements such as search and rescue, establishing temporary settlement in camps and elsewhere and providing medical assistance. And here, for example, you see a tent that's being set up with a disaster station, a medical disaster station with monitors, the ability to intubate and ventilate, as well as a variety of medications that would be appropriate for managing disasters. And um, not surprisingly, there's a lot of trauma that you might get, crush injuries that you might get. And we'll talk about some of the drugs that can be useful in this setting. Disaster recovery involves elements such as building reconstruction and infrastructure repair, such as this building here, which will have to be torn down and rebuilt. Let's talk about the emergency medical response to natural disasters. Um, here, an example of a patient who is being rescued from um, a, a collapsed building filled with dust and being brought over to the emergency station. 
The emergency medical response teams include physicians and surgeons, nurses and technicians, logistics specialists, care coordinators, quartermasters, particularly important uh, because you have to know where all the equipment is and how many of each item you've got, and then drivers as well as security personnel. So there's a lot of different teams involved and these are all important. The World Health Organization has a rich variety of resources that can be helpful for people planning for these kinds of disasters. On the left, they've got an article called Management of Limb Injuries During Disasters and Conflicts. In the middle, Management of Dead Bodies After Disasters. And you particularly you want to avoid spreading infection around. And on the right, Classification and Minimum Standards for Foreign Medical Teams in Sudden Onset Disasters. And this will be a valuable document in preparation of a response team. So the address on the bottom will allow you to get these uh, documents. Disaster training comes in uh, three levels. There is basic disaster life support, advanced disaster life support, and core disaster life support. And these are programs available uh, for the US from the US Department of Homeland Security. Uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and training from them is available for those that are interested. You can actually go and do independent study through this if you want. So the basic disaster life support course is about seven and a half hours, and it covers the core principles and concepts in emergency management and public health. Uh, and they have what they call the pre-disaster paradigm and the disaster paradigm. And the focus is the incorporation of an all hazards approach to mass casualty management. Information on that is available on the bottom right. Those who are interested in uh, getting more uh, qualifications can join the American Board of Disaster Medicine, which was organized in 2006. And in fact, uh, there's also the American Academy of uh, disaster medicine also organized in 2006 and the American Board of Disaster Medicine and the American Academy of, Academy of, of Disaster Medicine are two sister organizations that work together. As well, there is a journal uh, called Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine that is the official journal of the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine. This is published by Cambridge University Press and has a variety of articles pertinent to the problem of disaster medicine and pre-hospital care. Um, here is an article uh, called Anesthesia Provision in Disasters in Armed Conflicts, published in 2017 by Springer. And uh, here's an example of some of the articles that you can download uh, from the various journal sites. Here's one from the British Journal of Anesthesia. Managing Anesthetic Provision for Global Disasters from the uh, Bristol Royal Infirmatory in Bristol, UK, published in 2017. Uh, and what you'll see in many of these articles, as well as the training courses, is that there is an overall plan as shown here. Uh, the disaster strikes, you pack and deploy for them, you arrive at the scene, you are uh, assigned to a location, you move to that location, you treat patients, then you monitor the performance at the site and give, provide regular reports, and then you hand over to local authorities over time. So this is the process that uh, the WHO recommends, the World Health Organization, and more details are available at the resource indicated on the bottom. Uh, you can see it in more detail here disaster strikes, then you pack and deploy for that. And it says here, the turnaround time between the team assembly and supply transportation and deployment should be six to 12 hours. Then you arrive typically by aircraft and you are then assigned a location based on uh, information usually provided by the Ministry of Health. You move to that location and that's where the logistics and transportation is so important. And then you treat your patients. So natural disasters typically involve many trauma patients in the setting of a damaged infrastructure and limited resources. The hospital that you would normally treat a trauma patient in might be destroyed by earthquakes, for example. Disasters that occur in developing countries where healthcare resources and clinical personnel are scarce may experience a weak 
healthcare response in the disaster and may require outside support. In many cases, temporary hospitals must be set up in tents as shown here. Here you can see uh, uh, anesthesiologist planning for a spinal anesthetic in a patient and to the patient's um, right behind them, you can see the anesthesia machine with a single vaporizer. Regional anesthesia, as you might imagine, has a special role for some of these trauma patients as spinals are relatively easy to do uh, and don't require a lot of resources. The other drug that can be particularly useful is ketamine. And this article, Ketamine, the Drug of War, uh, discusses many of the aspects of the use of ketamine in this uh, setting. Ketamine is easy to use. It's relatively safe. It maintains respiration and uh, maintains blood pressure and heart rate. And this can be very useful, particularly in the young, otherwise healthy patients who tend to be military personnel. The World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists have launched this program called Ketamine is an Essential Medicine, trying to remind regulatory authorities that uh, despite the fact that ketamine is sometimes a drug of abuse, it's very important to the conduct of anesthesia under difficult circumstances. A recent study found that ketamine is available in 70% uh, of healthcare facilities, making it more accessible than any other drug or piece of uh, medical equipment, even more common than pulse oximetry, anesthesia machines, oxygen, and electricity. Um, unlike anesthetics, ketamine does not require reliable electricity to supply, doesn't require oxygen, although oxygen is always nice doesn't require highly trained staff or monitoring systems. It is a very useful anesthetic for difficult circumstances and it does make it an essential medicine. Now, what about ventilated patients in a natural disaster setting? Here is the story of uh, H1N1 and here we have the Times of India where we have a headline that says hospitals let H1N1 flu patients die. And this comes from Dr. Betha, assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine in India. Uh, he uh, showed that uh, without ventilators, patients die. And here they say a ventilator shortage at this hospital required the use of handheld devices like ambu bags or resuscitator bags. Uh, because emergency uh, uh, automatic ventilation was not available. And so as a result, many patients died who would otherwise be okay. Uh, and so this has led to an interest in automatic ventilators that are disposable. Uh, and this is the Vortran GoVent, uh, GoToVent. It's a single patient use disposable resuscitator. It can be operated uh, on a compressor, oxygen, or air with a minimum of 10 liters uh, per minute flow. Doesn't require electricity, doesn't require batteries, making it the ideal backup ventilator for the management of mass casualties, natural disasters, disease outbreaks, major power outages, and for patient transportation. So you can get this information at the um, address shown here at Vortran.com. Uh, so these are used once and then thrown away at the end of the clinical session. Features, lightweight, transparent, disposable, minimal training required for its use. You can adjust respiratory rate. You can adjust tidal volume. It's MRI and CT compatible. It's a pressure cycled ventilator. It doesn't measure volumes. It's gas powered and no backup batteries required. Choice FiO2 of 50% oxygen or 100% oxygen. You have an inline pressure manometer that can be used to measure peak inspiratory pressure and positive end expiratory pressure. And you can use it with an endotracheal tube, a mask, or a supraglottic airway. Two modes of ventilation. It can be uh, used in pressure cycled mode for mandatory breathing and in pressure support mode for spontaneous breathing in patients who can trigger or initiate a breath. Um, so. This is versatile that it can be used for both uh, ventilated patients as well as for patients breathing spontaneously. To uh, dial in the peak inspiratory pressure, there's a dial on the top and to dial in respiratory rate, you uh, use the dial on the bottom and the PEEP is preset to 20% of peak inspiratory pressure. So simple manual dials allow you to adjust the 
peak pressure that you want as well as the respiratory rate. What's interesting is that you can actually operate up to seven ventilators using one oxygen supply uh, in mass disaster casualties. So they call this the e-surge kit and they hook up the oxygen supplier, which typically would be a tank or a concentrator, uh, more, more commonly a large oxygen E-size cylinder or H-size cylinder. And you'd have a multi-output manifold uh, in here. Up to seven patients can be ventilated all at once with FiO2s of 50% or 100%, depending on clinical circumstances. Now, uh, one of the challenges that comes up in triage uh, in disaster medicine is the, is the hand, handling of triage. Uh, and a variety of approaches are available. The utilitarian approach is to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. The egalitarian approach is to distribute scarce resources irrespective of likely outcome. And the procedural approach is prioritization based on a patient's inclusion in a particular group, for example, by citizenship or by health insurance status. You can understand that uh, for many people, the utilitarian approach is the most commonly used approach, but different healthcare systems with different resources may take different approaches. But in all of these cases, it's important to have some sort of system to label the patients in terms of the urgency of their care. Patients that are the highest priority under red may have, for example, an obstructive airway or be hypoxemic or be tachycardic or have a Glasgow coma scale eight or under. Patients in the orange category, they're urgent, should be treated within 15 minutes. They may have a threatened airway. They may have a saturation, uh, arterial saturation between 80 and 9, uh, 89. Heart rates between 121, 130. Glasgow coma scale between three uh, between nine and 13 and so on. Less urgent would be the uh, yellow patients who should be treated within 60 minutes. And then the green patients are patients should be treated within the next three hours. So these are an this is an example of how you can prioritize and triage your patients. And this is the suggestion made from the Scandinavian Journal of Trauma Resuscitation and Emergency Medicine. One of the things that's interesting is that when you have trauma patients and they need to be transported, uh, this can be very complicated. Here we have an example of a portable life care, uh, portable life support system. It's a gurney with a built-in ventilator, oxygen concentrator uh, operated on batteries, drug infusions that um, uh, can be given, for example, for pressors uh, or for sedation. And it's all self-contained and portable. Uh, can be useful when you want to transport a patient, an intubated patient in particular, long distances via aircraft or via ground transportation. Here is the uh, system uh, shown here, intended for military or civilian use, the transport life support system. It's portable and you just hook it to the size of the gurney or the stretcher and you can ventilate this patient as well as do other things. It supplies its own oxygen source by, by way of a built-in oxygen concentrator. Truly amazing. So it features built-in vital sign monitor, can measure uh, antidal CO2 by capnography, oxygen concentration, arterial blood pressure, CVP if you want, non-invasive blood pressure, pulse oximetry, electrocardiogram, graphic analysis as well as a uh, temperature. Oxygen concentrator, FiO2 uh, up to 50, uh, 85%. A ventilator that's built in with intermittent mandatory variation, uh, assist control, pressure support, and so on, as well as suction. All in a portable system, very convenient for those who uh, want to go long distances by helicopter or on ground transport. So to conclude, Although natural disasters come in many forms, the rescue response to most of these events is similar. Prior planning and careful logistical analysis is essential to ensure optimal outcomes following a natural disaster. The World Health Organization offers many helpful online resources. Ketamine is an anesthetic drug particularly suited for providing anesthesia in resource limited settings and disposable ventilators can be useful in mass casualty settings. 
I have some videos that I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, and so you can click on any of uh, these links to uh, get to watch these videos, more information available for those that are interested in supplementary information. And as well, I have a variety of references. Here's the first eight, and here is the next eight that can be useful for people who want more information. Thank you very much for your time. It's much appreciated, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Professor Doyle, for that excellent and informative um, lecture. Um, in summary, Dr. Doyle spoke about COVID-19 airway management and recommendations from different societies. Also spoke about disaster preparedness and which courses and certifications you could obtain. He made also references to journals, which at the end, um, he also has 16 references that you can review this lecture and access them. Um, spoke about the importance of anesthesia provision during disaster. And uh, I think those are concepts that you can apply to any type of disaster and also to our current times. Um, the importance of ketamine as an aesthetic uh, in difficult circumstances, um, how to address ventilator um, shortage with disposable ventilators, that was very interesting, and also about triaging. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, for you on to, in the meantime, while we get questions from the audience, um, what advice would you give to leaders, um, directors regarding the preparation for disasters? I, I think the most important single thing would be, the most important single thing would be to establish a document that involves all the stakeholders that uh, would be a plan. And then later on to have an opportunity to have a dry run for a particular sim simulated disaster. So uh, the, the plan, you can get some basic plans from various organizations, and then you would have to adjust them to your particular set of circumstances. And in particular, you would have to have a list of all the players involved so they can be contacted immediately. Thank you. Um, that's one of, I will use my hospital as an example. We have a disaster plan. Um, hospital wise and then each department has their own plan regarding their um, their areas and it's a plan that can be transformed to either a natural chemical you know any type of disaster but it's easily adjustable and those are reviewed yearly um, so that way you're always ready um, another question that i have is how do you adjust that plan when you have a global competition for resources like we are facing right now with COVID-19 because usually with disasters, it's a local or a national event. And then you can get your resources that you were, as you were mentioning, you know, your ketamine or your portable um, disposable ventilators. But how do we compensate when the whole world is competing for the same resources? So, <laughs> That's a question that even and takes place at the national level. Yep. Uh, and unfortunately, at the national level, often political issues trump scientific issues. Uh, and so what may be the recommendations of some of the uh, experts in the field may not get implemented to the degree they wish because of other considerations. Uh, for the most part, you'll want to stockpile the required resources. And many of these resources uh, have limited shelf life and that can be a problem as well. So there's no easy solution other than to try and plan ahead as much as you can. And remember that the first part in the disaster management is mitigation. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, we had to adapt uh, was tr preparing for the difficult decision making, which is what you mentioned at the end of your lecture, when you have to triage um, in mass casualty type events um, because of this competing area of resources. And um, we had been giving lectures uh, to our friends in Guatemala, also our friends in India, 
um, you know, now that they have, you know, difficult with oxygen. So that is also part that you have to prepare for that type of difficult decision. And I think that's my learning point um, through this pandemic that also difficult decision making will happen um, and should be in that part of the plan. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, let's see if we have any questions from the rest of the panel or any from the audience. I am trying to check here. Um, no questions for now. Well, thank you very much, Professor Doyle. And uh, to our audience, thank you. Um, you can also access this lecture um, on Facebook Live and also through their new website that has been launched. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. Thank you. Thank you very much.